Okay, hi there. My name is Yasser Edwards, and I'm a Ruby developer uh, from Egypt. Everybody knows where Egypt is? Okay, in case you don't know, <laughs> there it is. Okay, I work at eSpace. I'm a lead developer. We mainly do web development, web 2.0, 2.0 development, and mobile development for, for uh, embedded devices. So, I'm here to talk about Never block. <laughs> okay, uh, this language is called hieroglyphic language. It, it, it was used like thousands of years ago by the ancient Egyptian people, like 7,000 years or something. And I have no idea how on earth can anyone use this to communicate. <laughs> so this is the English version of the last slide. I'm going to talk about never block. So what's never block? Okay. Uh, Neverblock assembly is a non-blocking I/O Ruby library that helps you execute concurrent code in a transparent way. So, how do we achieve that? Okay, before I talk about how do we do that with Neverblock, let me introduce to you in specific what what problem are we attacking. So. In no block, we do we do provide some way to execute concurrent code that use that that do, that does DB and network access. Okay, and we do that without the need to change the program flow. Okay, so here's the problem: we have that piece of code that runs. That, that contains a blocking, some blocking uh, operations, whether they are DB calls or network operations, and we need to execute that code, that piece of code, several times. Okay, so so there are like three standard ways to do that, and never block is the fourth way that I'm going to talk about. So the first way to do that is using a normal single thread application. You write your code in a synchronous blocking way. So let's have an explanation of this example. It's simple. We have, first we acquire um, MySQL adapter. Then we initialize the count with a number. The count is the number of times that we want to execute our block. And then we initialize one, only one. We need only one database connection. And then we define our block. It's simple block only does that. It, it issues a query uh, with, a, with a select sleep 0.1 seconds. And then it iterates over the results and do whatever it wants to do. So this is our block. And we simply called our block within a, a count of time loop that will execute count times. So if count is 100, uh, this code typically runs in 10 seconds. Okay. So, the other alternative is doing this in a thread way, okay? So, we initiate a thread for each execution of that block. Okay, so, um, we did the same initialization there. The only different thing that we need to do is we initialize uh, multiple connections, each connection to be used in single thread, and then, we define our, our block the same as the other uh, other block in the previous slide, uh, and then we execute our code within a count the times loop. But we need to take care of something. We need to care, to handle thread safety. So we need to synchronize our block to protect shared variables such as the connections array that we use to get the connections out of it. So, and we just execute our code in a typical way. So this code runs typically in one second because we have like 10 threads and we have like count, count threads that are executing in simultaneously. And this code typically runs in one second. Okay, the only verification we had to do, we need to, we need to take care of three safety requirements. So we had to do, create a mutex and issue a synchronize on the block that we are 
colon. Okay, there's the third alternative is to do that in an evented driven way. So as you might have expected, this has to be a little bit different. Instead of just having one block to call, we now have two blocks. Okay, it's our before block, that's where we issue the asynchronous calls, and we have our after block, that, that, that is the, our callback function. Okay, so in the before block, we, of course, we, uh, first we, we create as many connections as needed, and then uh, in our before clock, uh, block, we just issue a send, what's called a send query method. Send query is an asynchronous call that just sends the query to the database. And actually, this is this what this happens to be. Um, this this was found in the Postgre driver. Postgre has a synchronous driver for 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 uh, for asynchronous uh, queries. Um, MySQL, the typical standard MySQL driver, did not have one. So uh, we did initiate an initiative to write a MySQL driver that supports asynchronous calls. And thanks to other contributors um, that has done a lot of efforts till the, we had what we call the MySQL Plus adapter. So anyway, now in the event model, we issue uh, a send query, okay? And then we have to keep a reference with our IO objects that will be waiting for later, okay? Um, and then we have to keep references as well, as well with the, our connections that we will be listening at and we'll get notified at that we have uh, data available to read. Then this is our after block or the callback function. Okay, the after block, what it does mainly is it gets the connection that has available that already and started processing, getting a uh, call and get result on the connection and starts processing the results as we did in the previous example. So um, to, to be able to execute that, we have to call count the times on the before block. So we call the asynchronous code count times. And then we have must have some kind of an event cycling thing. So we have to, we need to do, to either register with the, something like the event machine, or we just have to, may do an infinite loop and a select call. Okay, if you're not familiar with select call, um, select method takes four parameters. First parameter, a readable array of IO objects. Second parameter, readable array, a writable array for IO objects. Third parameter is an array of errors um, of IA of IO objects that that you should be waiting for expecting errors and fourth parameter is the timeout. So basically a select call is a blocking call that does not return unless either of these conditions was was achieved. I, I mean for example in our case we only passed the first parameter which is a readable array so unless there is a, a readable data at either of the sockets that are passed in the, this array, the, the call is blocking. So it will only return as long as there is data available on any of the sockets associated with the I.O. object in the, in the readables array. So anyway, when, when, when this select call, whenever a data array is ready to, to read, we get out the I.O. object and issues, and after call block, that's our callback, and then, in the after call block that gets executed, extracts the connection and then calls quit result and start to do, uh, to process our, the rest of our code logic. So this code typically runs in one second. What's good about this model is that it's a little bit faster than thread model, but as you must have noticed, it, it's a twisted model. You have to split your code to fit into this event-driven uh, model. So if you are to about to initiate another blocking call, you have to do that in the after block, which is the callback. 
same as like you do when, when you when you issue an AJAX call, you issue an AJAX request, and then when you need to issue another one, you you issue it in the callback or or the response of the first request, and then if you need to issue another one, you need to do that in the callback of the second request, and so on. So this code typically runs in one second. Okay, here's things how things are done with the never block thing. Um, Typically, we initialize us what we call our fiber pool. We will come to fiber shortly. Second, we don't create a bunch of connections as we did in the evented and the thread mode. Um, we have our own connection pooling mechanism. So we just get what we call a pool database connection. So that's the C variable is a connection, just one single connection that's, that we get uh, from our database pool, uh, pool co connection pool. And then we define our block in a very normal way, that exactly as we did in the uh, normal, in the fir very first example, in a normal way. Okay, so we didn't have to split anything, just issue our query and then get the results. And then we run count the times we can't run, we run the, uh, the call, ex the execute, we execute the block, our block using the call method in a count of times array, only with a little change, okay? Uh, we run that inside what's called a spawn method. That's what, what the spawn method does, it, it, it executes the block within the context of a, of a single fiber. Uh, we'll come to fiber shortly, and all this, bunch of block is executed within an event machine. So if event machine will run, count the times, and then fiber pool would spawn a single fiber that executes this very uh, method. So typically this, call, uh, this, this uh, program runs in almost one second as well. Okay, only that you don't need to split your code. You, you write it in a very straightforward way like as you did in the threading. And almost also you didn't you didn't manage to do get to do any threat safety handling issues. Never no mutexes, no nothing. So before we get to how in details we were able to achieve that, I'll just summarize the the, uh, the pros and cons of the evented versus the thread model. Okay, as you might have noticed, evented model. I'm talking about Ruby. Evented model versus thread model in Ruby. Okay, so. Event model Ruby is faster, more scalable. We have no thread safety requirements, but the only issue is it has a twisted development model, which means that you have to adjust your code to fit into this event-driven model, okay? And it is faster than threads in Ruby because threads in Ruby are green threads. I'm sure you're aware of that fact. And other thing is because of the whole switch context switching thing between threads. So, and it's more scalable because it consumes less, much less resources than threads do. Of course, thread in, is the other way around. It's slower, less scalable, and it has thread safety requirement. The only thing is it's, it has a direct development mode. Okay, never block brings the benefits of the evented model only in a direct development way, so that you don't have to worry about, you know, adjusting your code to fit into the ordinary event-driven model. Okay, so it's the best of both worlds. So you have a fast code that is run concurrently and it's scalable. You have no threat safety requirements, and you just write your code in your in its normal flow. Okay, so how was that? How was that possible? It's possible due to fibers, okay? So, fibers, what are fibers? Fibers are just methods, they are coroutines, okay? That you are able to use, just as you are, you are able to use threads, but you are able to, 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 to resume and to pose fibers on demand. That's the, the core difference between threads and fibers. In a fiber, it's your duty or your, your responsibility to do this context switching between one fiber and the other, okay? So when you can resume a fiber 
and you can yield back from the fiber and give context and give processing away from it. Okay, so this is an example of how fiber as it are used. First, this is a fiber block, what you call a fiber block. Okay, this only defines a fiber, it does not run anything. Okay, so this is the fiber block, we just a simple block, x equals x, then fiber yield x, x equals 6, fiber yield x, y equals 8, equals 7. This is the definition of a fiber block, okay? So, the new thing is, we need to know about, is the yield keyword and the resume keyword, okay? So, let me just start by the resume keyword. After defining the block code, okay, on the very first call to our resume method, we enter the, the into the very first entry point of the block of the fiber. Okay, so on the very first call to resume, execution is started to be at that step. Okay, so x equals five. This is the step that's be, that's executed right away after the first resume call. Okay, then. Second, fiber to yield is executed. Fiber to yield actually does two things. First of all, it returns the value that is passed as a parameter, so it returns x, just a normal return. Second, it gives away control to the very next line after the last resume method was called. So, after fiber to yield x was called, execution will happen to be at this step, at this line, okay? So we now have the return value for the resume method is, is the very same uh, return value of the yield method, which is the parameter x that was passed. So that's why I put f.resume on the very first line, outputs five, okay? Another call to resume would resume execution back on the very first line after the, 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 the last yield that was called, so that would be x equals 6, and so on. On the last, the last call to, to, to resume, in that case, that will bring us after the second yield here, and then the return value of the block is the return value of the resume function and not the, the, the parameter that was passed to the yield because we, ha we have no yield method at the last statement, okay? So the return value of the resume function is either the parameter that is passed within the return, within the yield method, or the return of the block of the fiber after it has finished executing. So the very last, the, the third resume statement is going to return seven. So puts f dot resume. The third one is going to output seven. Another call would be uh, would raise an error because the, uh, our fiber is dead. The the block has finished ex ex execution. Okay. Uh, what's great about fibers is that they can do two-way communication. We saw in the last example that we used the value that's passed in the yield method to as the return value of the resume. Uh, call, but well, then we can use it the other way around. We can pass parameters to the resume method, okay, and that can be used within the fiber block, okay. So the first value that's passed to the resume method can be used as the value of the block variable, which is x. So the very first call to resume seven, which which call would enter the first line of the fiber block with a value of x equals to seven. And then fiber dot yield seven is executed, so that's why I puts f dot resume seven output seven. And the next the next step puts dot f resume six, okay, will happen to continue execution at the at the assignment of the y operation. So the next step after resume six is called is that we will enter back the fiber again, and y equals six statement is executed. Then, the next statement that is executed is fiber dot yield six, seven, uh, sorry, fiber dot six, uh, yield six, okay? That gives away con uh, control again back to the very next line after the, the last resume call, okay? And that's why the, so 
what we what we did what we did here is that we were able to pass parameter among across across uh, the the, uh, the the fiber block in and out. So we did pass a parameter the resume method, which was used in the in the uh, uh, block parameter. Okay, and we were able also to to use the return value of the that uh, of the resume method as being the parameter that's passed to the yield method. Okay, so. Another code is to resume with the parameter of five, okay, would just happen to bring us back here to the assignment, or the next statement, which is assignment of the Z parameter to six, which is the return value of, of, the, of this block. So, uh, sorry, to five, which is the return value of, of this block. So Z happens to equals five, and then the, state, the next statement is a equals two, which is the last statement of our block. So this is the return, this will be the return value of the of this resume call. So it outputs two, and of course another call to the on resume uh, raises a fiber error. So this way we were able to pass to pass arguments back and forth between uh, between uh, fiber, fiber context, inside the a fiber context and outside, outside the fiber context. So we were able to do what's called the context switching and we do pass parameter back and forth between the inside the fiber and outside the fiber. So that's why we can do two-way communication using fibers. Okay? So what's great about fibers are that they are, require much less resources than threads do. Okay? So for example, on this very machine, I was able to, I was not able to create above 800 threads per process, 8,000 threads per process, and that was in like seven seconds. But I was able to create above 200,000 fibers, and that's the memory usage at the 8,000 number of 8,000 threads versus 1,000 fibers. It's like 4x or something. Okay, and of course, that, that's what, what we mean by th that fibers in Ruby are more scalable and, and more faster than uh, threads. Okay, so what never block typically uses is a combination of fibers and what's called the event machine to, to achieve concurrency in a transparent way to the programmer so that you don't have to worry about uh, breaking your code to fit into the event model. Okay, so it's mainly an event-based development, but only we achieve that in a transparent way by using fibers, so that you don't have to split your code. You just write your code in a normal way. Okay. The only thing that Never Block requires is that the whatever I/O access that you're going to to do, where, whether it is. Uh, um, a network access or a DB access that you must have asynchronous calls supported within this library. For example, that's why we started supporting first. We start. We were supporting PostGrade. We we wrote first. We first wrote Neverlock for for PostGrade because it has an asynchronous driver for DB access. So that was that gives us the ability to 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 issue asynchronous queries, and then after. A lot of efforts of other people, and we work with other people to get MySQL Plus done. So now we support both MySQL and PostgreSQL. So NeverBlock currently works very well with MySQL and Post and PostgreSQL servers to achieve concurrent DB access. Okay. Also, NeverBlock supports Ruby sockets, which means that libraries like NetHttp can Actually, you can run concurrent calls of, of network access using this library, okay, and in transparent way as well. And then, for web applications, we used Thin Server because Thin is is, is event uses event-based model to dispatch its request to Rails. So we used a combination of Thin servers. And we made use of its event and mach event machine that's that ships with it. Only we did a little modification to the event machine to be able to attach our own connections to it and deattach it. So um, using a combination of of uh, thin and 
um, and it's built in uh, event machine where we were able to write co to write web applications that where requests are, pro are processed con concurrently within a single thin server. So we have a, a single thin server that process that's able to process multiple concurrent requests at a time. Typically, what you need to do is is you have to 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 uh, to get like several instances of thin running to serve multiple requests, okay? But that way, a single instance of a thin server can serve multiple requests in a concurrent way, uh, thanks to the event machine that's shipped with a thin server, okay? Also, as for Rails, never block supports um, active record, so that's cool, uh, that's really um, caused the uh, Rails applications to run um, concurrently in a little, uh, in actually no, you don't need to add any extra line of code. All you need to do is a couple of requires. Okay, so um, never block support trails really out of the box. Let's have a visualized Rails example. Okay, this is a theme server with with its event machine. Okay. We have our fiber pool that's injected in the thin server, okay? And we didn't live in vacation to how thin server dispatched its request to, to, to Rails framework. So, first, when request A arrives, thin, uh, the event machine tells the thin server that there is a request A that is to be processed, okay? So instead of just Processing the request in the normal way, we get we spawn out fiber of the fiber rule that's injected in the thin server, and we run that request in the context of of a single fiber. Okay, and then each rectangle of those represents a single fiber that serves a single request. Okay, with those um, blue parts as being the non-blocking parts of the request, and the red parts being the blocking parts of the request. So, what typically happens is when a request A arrives, it's, it starts being processed within a fiber, a single fiber context, okay, until it reaches a blocking operation. When, whenever it reaches a blocking operation, it yields back control to the thin server to be able to run another request. But before before you do that, you have to register your, your, your current I.O. connection with the event machine, you know, and, and, and do what's called the I.O. completion request, okay? So that the event machine will later on notifies the fiber that, is, that there's data available and, and so that the fiber can resume execution, okay? So after the fiber A, yields control to the thin server, the thin server starts getting a new request, which is request B, okay? Um, start processing the non-blocking part of the request, and then whenever it reaches a blocking part, again, it registers with the event machine again, and requires I.O. completion notification for that very connection that, as, that is associated with this request. And then, at that time, <coughs> The event machine fires a completion notification for the very first request A. So fiber A resumes execution at the very last point it left. And that way we utilized, you even utilized the CPU usage. The CPU usage was highly uh, enhanced and, and so on. That's the basic idea, okay? So what actually, what modifications do you actually need to make to your Rails application? Just a bunch of few requires. Just you require the, your never block library. You require your, your never block support for Rails. And then you require your never block support for your server, which is thin in that case. And then in the database with YML, you write that you are after is never block post gray or never, uh, never block MySQL instead of just writing the normal uh, adapter. Okay, and there you go. That way, with a combination of uh, a thin server and uh, a rail stack and never block libraries, you are able to achieve multiple, to serve multiple requests in a given single 
thread applications, that means that you, within a single instance of a theme server, you can actually serve multiple requests. Um, some people would, uh, would might, might have wondered that if, if this is actually used in productions. Yes, it is. And it's used in, this is um, one of our products. It's called MeOwns. Um, actually, MeOwns, um, it's about some social networking where you have to share your ownings and stuff uh, with other people and share interests with them. So, um, before using Neverblock, we were having like 16 instances of theme servers, okay? After using Neverblock, we almost have to run like four instances. And so we have to, we had to, uh, we reached like 75% of memory saving. Okay, um, here's a, few, a full feature list for Neverblock. It's currently, what, what, what we currently support is we provide full support to MySQL and to Postgre, to Ruby sockets, to NetHTP libraries, to Active Record, and it also has been tested and, and work, it's working with Rails 2.1 and of course with, with Thin. We do have problems with uh, Mongrel server though. What we need to do um, later on is we might be able to to provide better network support, and we have issues with Rails 2.2 because um, in Rails 2. Point, up to Rails uh, 2.1, we have no uh, no such thing as uh, as connection pooling, database connection pooling. You only whenever you need a connection, you create it. So typically, you use just one connection per throughout your application. So we introduced the concept of uh, connection pooling in our ne never block. So we do have our never block connection pool, and now Rails 2.2 ships with its own connection pool, so we just want to make sure that we see uh, really conforms with the behavior and the standard of the uh, interface of the of the connection pool of Rails 2.2. Okay. We also what we need to do is to support more backends other than the event machine, like for example Revector, and um, other frameworks like Mer Merv and Ramazi or Ramazi. I don't know how that is pronounced. We also need to support other uh, ORM tools. Um, other than Active Record, like Data Mapper and SQL, and of course, all ideas are welcome. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> questions? No. Yeah. Does the code need to be thread safe? No. Then no. Fibers uh, relieves you from from from. Uh, actually, that's what's great about fibers. Uh, you don't need to worry about about uh, thread safety at all. Okay, that's the core di uh, co one core difference between fibers and threads. That in threads you you actually have to do all the music things and synchronization stuff. In fibers, you don't have to do that. Okay, so whether you're using Rails and using never block out the box or using your, your own Ruby code like we did in the very first example, uh, you don't have to, to do synchronization stuff at all. Any other questions? Yeah, they, they, all of your fibers share an address space, don't they? What? Do, do fibers share an address space? So that a class level variable in one fiber is the same as a class level variable in another fiber? Well, um, actually, uh, yes, yes and no. Okay. Uh, um, one thing with fibers that you need to take care about is sharing static variables. Okay. We, you must not share static variables between between fibers. Okay. So, what you need to do is just inject your fiber pool in whatever um, event machine you, you whatever backend you need, and then within from within the uh, fiber from within your fiber pool, you just do the context the whole context switching things with passing parameters back and forth so that you do not need to, 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 to share um, your memory space, okay? Okay, but a class level variable, if you're using like a class variable for a cache, then you do have to worry about the right because yeah. the data would be shared by the Yeah, that's correct, that's true. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs>